Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I also want to welcome all of the remote viewers who are joining us. I'm super excited to have um, all of you here in the auditorium and um, everyone in our remote um, in our remote viewing crowd. It's really exciting. This is only the um, third meeting that we've hosted um, in person um, since the, really the start of COVID, and so. Um, we're, we're sort of still adjusting to this hybrid environment, but it's, it's really exciting to have you all here, both remotely and in person. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping announcements before I turn it over to um, Jennifer and Ron. Um, I do want to ask the speakers to please try really hard to stick to your um, allotted talk times, um, most of which are 15 minutes plus five minutes for Q&A. Um, I think the Q&A portion is really important. I think you guys are going to get a lot of questions um, in the next uh, day and a half, so um, please leave four or five minutes for questions. Um, to help you with that, you will see a timer um, up here to your left. You'll see a green light uh, for the majority of your talk. You'll see a yellow light um, when there are two minutes left and a red light when we ask that you conclude. And I've also asked the session chairs to be strict so that we can have some Q&A time. Um, speakers, please be sure to come up here to the podium and set up your talk with the AV staff at the start of the break prior to your talk time. Um, please don't wait until the last minute. Um, it's good for you to be able to run through your slides and make sure all is working well. Um, for the in-room audience, please use um, the microphones to ask your questions, because if you don't use the mics, the remote audience is not going to hear your great questions. So we have a, a few um, uh, catch box mics, which you can see the, the green and the orange, and we will be tossing them around. Um, alternatively, you're welcome to come up to the standing mics and ask your questions. Uh, for the session chairs, if somebody does happen to ask a question um, without a mic, please just use um, one of the mics to repeat the question to the speaker. Um, please turn off all of your cell phones and other ringing devices so that they don't go off during the meeting and they will interfere with the microphones. Um, social media. So this is an open meeting, um, open to the world. You're welcome to post about how great it is and how cool Janelia is, but please do not post any um, images of people's data. Um, that should really be avoided. Um, so, so please, please try, please, please do not do that. Um, I do want to mention that the talks and the discussion periods are being recorded. They will be available for viewing. They'll be posted on the conference website um, soon after they happen. So you can check the website if you want to watch the recordings. Um, there is a job opportunities board in the lobby. Um, so if any of you here have um, uh, opportunities that you would like to post in your own lab, in your institute, in your department, um, please, you're welcome to print those out in the library and post them. You're welcome to, to send them to me at the conference email account. Um, that you've gotten a lot of emails from. And even, honestly, even our remote audience, if you have a position that you would like to post in your group or in your institute, please send it to me at conference at janelia.hhmi.org, um, and we will gladly print it out and put it, post it on our opportunities board. Um, I think the last announcement I want to make is that the agenda has just been updated today. Um, uh, the online version of the agenda is current, as is the printed copy um, outside of the room, so make sure you're using one of those for reference. I did not introduce myself at the start. My name is Janine Stevens. Um, I think you guys probably got a lot of emails from me. I'm uh, super happy to meet all of you in person. And uh, if you need anything during the conference, please feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer for the good stuff. Thank you, Janine. Um, yes, Janine has been absolutely fabulous in organ organizing this meeting. Um, just, you know, all the little details and everything that have gone into this has really been, um, you know, we can really thank Janine for it, so thank you. Um, I want to welcome all of you to this 40CP uh, symposium. This is the first of the kind that we are, have had uh, for our 40 cellular physiology res research area here at Janelia, which really only started about a month ago. Um, basically, over the last year, we were in a hiring mode, and uh, we hired uh, nine new GL, uh, group leaders into this program. You will hear uh, 
nearly all of them talk over the next few days. But in addition to that, uh, we've uh, brought in experts and uh, uh, really the talent in this field from all over the world who are going to share their interests, their perspectives on how to uh, interrogate cells, not just in a tissue culture setting like many of us, like myself, have spent most of their career in, but instead look at cells from a bigger perspective, from a perspective of the way they're operating uh, with other groups of cells in tissues, but also uh, in a whole organismal setting. So that is going to be the topic of this symposium today. Um, we hope uh, that, well, well, we are planning to have yearly symposiums of this type uh, ongoing as part of an effort to really build a community of uh, 40 cellular physiology uh, where uh, basically researchers can come together, uh, share their ideas, share their technologies, um, uh, different perspectives uh, in, a, in a way that allows the field to grow in a, in a, in a good, good, good way. Um, I think this is a super exciting time right now uh, in this field. We have so much information uh, that's at our fingertips uh, that's being acquired from many different types of technologies. Um, what is really needed is uh, basically um, hard thinking about what that information is all about. And that's what uh, we hope to be able to be able to tap into uh, with this type of meeting. So um, over the next couple of days, you're going to be hearing uh, perspective talks, research talks, poster presentations, and group discussions. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about who's participating. Uh, in addition to Janillians and our new group leaders in the 40CP program, we have a lot of invited guests and speakers, and we also have 30 trainees uh, who are graduate students and postdocs uh, that were selected from a pool that applied to this symposium. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't take more than 30 because of limitations in terms of our housing, um, uh, but the applicants as a whole were really tremendous uh, in terms of uh, their talent. Now, I also want to say that in addition to the people here in person, we have close to 1,000 people that are registered to view this remotely. Um, and I think this level of participation is really reflective of a broad interest in 40CP that we are just sort of at the tip of the iceberg in terms of really exploring as a new field. So with that, I want to say, uh, trainees, don't hesitate to grab people to talk to them, uh, ask questions, and uh, for the rest of you, please embrace uh, the moment uh, and enjoy. With that, I want to hand over to Ron for his, his comments. Um, thank you, Janine, for the amazing work in bringing us all together, and I also want to extend my welcome uh, to everyone here today. This meeting is really the starting gun for a 15-year effort in this emerging field of uh, 4D cellular physiology. Uh, it's amazing to think, where are we going to be 15 years from now? Um, I'm, I'm sure um, uh, amazing things are going to happen between now and then. So uh, we have many new group leaders here and senior group leaders, as Jennifer said, uh, who have just joined us on this grand, uh, long adventure. And you'll have a chance to meet them during this symposium. Um, but you know, as Jennifer alluded to, this effort really is much, much bigger um, than uh, Janelia. And 4DCP is, is really the interface of two classic fields, the field of cell biology and the field of uh, physiology. And we're trying to create this new merger and interface. And it's a challenge for the field of cell biology to really think of how cells work and behave in native tissue environments and not just in tissue culture. And it's a challenge for the field of physiology to think of cellular and molecular explanations for long-standing uh, organismal physiological uh, phenomena. So, um, you know, there's a, a lot of work in, in front of us, and 
What we really want to embrace here at Genelia and this program is to really be an outward um, uh, facing um, uh, effort for the, this whole field and to engage uh, the global scientific community. So that's the spirit of the symposium, as you heard from, from Jennifer. It's, it's remote, it's in person. Um, and that was also the spirit of the nine uh, 40CP uh, workshops uh, that were held last year that, again, Janine did a fantastic job organizing. And I thank many of you here and remotely for participating in this. Um, and this you know, emerging field is uh, for sure going to need uh, new tools. Uh, which uh, Janelia and many of you will embark with, uh, bark on around the world. But it's also in need of new concepts and understanding, uh, as we can see in, the, in this new slide. And I hope that really Janelia can provide a nexus for interactions and collaboration. And also, as Jennifer said, a, a center for deep intellectual conversation about the important questions of the field. And I think that's also going to be an important framing of this particular um, meeting. Um, so um, we have a, a great group of scientists for this one and a half uh, day event. And uh, really, there's no one better to get our brains thinking about our brain and about our body and what it means to be a multicellular organism than uh, Ruslan Mezitov, who will kick things off. And you can see his incredibly evocative uh, challenge, not just for the, for, not just for Genelio and 40CP, but for the entire field of uh, biology. So I think you're going to get this off to a roaring start, Ruslan, um, by telling us your thoughts about uh, how we move from uh, data to knowledge to understanding. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I also want to thank Janine, uh, Jennifer, and Ron for organizing this and inviting me. And I wish I remember what I had in mind when I put this title, when I submitted that title when I was uh, uh, meeting the deadline. But uh, so my talk would be a little bit um, in, in not a regular sort of seminar type of talk or conference talk. It would be more of a free-flowing sort of uh, ideas uh, about what might be important for the next uh, frontier in the field of 4DCP, which is a very broad field, which is great. And I tried to uh, incorporate uh, uh, a few things that, uh, the, in, in my biased uh, subjective opinion, may be uh, big questions. And the other thing I want to mention is that my talk Kind of what I, the audience I had in mind is really students, postdoc, maybe junior faculty, um, uh, because of the nature of the talk. So um, I want to start with a few points I want to make about how our knowledge develops in in sciences in general, but in biomedical sciences in particular. So the knowledge structure generally looks like this: there's some general concept or general theory, then there is some subfields, which would be special cases of the general concept. And then there are subspecial cases and so forth, and it goes on like this. And what I want to emphasize here is that the way that the knowledge develops in different fields, in, in uh, exact sciences and soft sciences, is something like this. In math and physics, it moves upwards. In math and physics, they don't care about special case. So they only care about it if it helps to solve the more general case. Um, and uh, in biology, in general, it moves in the other direction. Of course, there are exceptions. There are some uh, um, fields of biology, like uh, biochemistry, biophysics. They're, they're, they're not quite like that, but soft biology, like immunology. So I can say that because I'm coming from that. It moves in the other direction. There is more and more details. There is more and more subspecialties and so forth. And what it does, um, it, it, it's not that it's good or bad. It's just the way it is. And both directions are important. But what it does, if it only moves in that other direction, the way that biology is, is that it creates these subfields that each develops its own terminology uh, that fragments the science and insulates it. So we now speak different languages. Uh, nobody can understand immunologists or neuroscientists when they talk neuroanatomy, unless you specifically studied those terms. 
And what that does is that the general concepts, even if they develop in subfields, they don't uh, become, um, uh, they, they don't become general uh, theories because uh, people speak different languages. And, uh, and of course the picture is uh, even more um, dramatically can be illustrated something like this, that what we individually study, we always can think that we are in some studying something that's sub, sub, sub special case. But what this also reflects is that the way I always think about whatever strange phenomenon we study in any field, since everything in biology is a product of evolution, it's produced by the same basic processes of evolution, it's all variation on the theme, then whatever we study is always a special case of something general and one question that's always useful to ask, what is this special case of? You find something very interesting, very unique. What is its special case of? Because it's always a special case of something else, something more general. When I have new students in the lab, I always tell them that there are four types of projects in science uh, that are defined by whether the question is known or original or whether uh, approach uh, is uh, available or not. So type one projects is when the question is known, the approach is available, and that's what probably 90, 95% of science is. This is what Thomas Kuhn would call normal science, right? That's where all the competition is. That's what, you know, herd behavior uh, drives that funding, publishing, and so forth. And type one science uh, is the, the bulk of science we do. And then there is type two projects when question is known, uh, but the approach is not available, and this is limited by developing appropriate technologies and ways to address this question. This is, uh, um, this is uh, what's limited by available uh, technologies. And then uh, the type three is the, my favorite one is when the approach is available, but question is novel. It's a regional question. You ask different question, but you address it by available tools. And type four, of course, is combination. So it's rare when the question is new and approach is new. Uh, that uh, that's right. But these four types of projects also reflect four stages of development of uh, scientific fields. Uh, it starts with development of a new paradigm, and that's very rare, and rightfully so. We don't want new paradigms every two hours, right? Uh, it needs to be only when the field is ready for it. Then there is development of experimental methods and tools uh, that are necessary to address new paradigm. Then there is generation of empirical knowledge, which is type one project, this is the majority of science, so it's 90% or so. And then there is synthesis uh, of principles and theories. And the point is that, and this was published in this paper that I really like by Alexander Schneider. Uh, what's really important about it is that different scientists, they fit different categories and different categories require different type of thinking and different type of talent. So when funding agencies decide on the merits of a particular scientist, uh, judging everyone from the same, uh, on the same scale, that's obviously wrong. Some people are good at developing new paradigms. The type of thinking here is very different from uh, generation empirical knowledge because in generation of empirical knowledge, there is very little tolerance for error. But in creating new paradigms, if you have low tolerance for error, you're not gonna get anywhere. And my favorite example of that is when Dmitry Mendeleev developed periodic uh, law of elements. He was not the first one to try to do that. There were several German scientists who tried to do that, but they tried to, do, tried, they tried to be too precise. And because there were gaps in knowledge about the elements, they failed. Mendeleev, on the other hand, said, well, here we don't know, maybe we'll leave a gap. And if we do that, then boom, there is this pattern emerges, and this is really sounds like this is a fundamental law. And of course, he was criticized for that uh, by people who did not, did not want any sloppiness in the concept, but of course he was right. But the point is that he could not have developed it if he tried to adhere to strict uh, uh, error-free type of uh, uh, data, because it was not possible, and that's not how creative process works. And um, this means that for different stages of science, for different uh, types of problems, uh, there are different talents and everyone should try to figure out where they belong. 
And there is nothing wrong with any one of these stages, by the way. So you cannot have everyone doing, creating new paradigms or only developing new tools and so forth. The way it plays out is that uh, uh, people basically uh, find their, uh, where their talent is best applied. And um, the second point I want to make is about uh, what we refer to different types of knowledge. And uh, so I think that there, there one can distinguish three types of three levels of knowledge, empirical, rational, and creative. Uh, the empirical knowledge operates on the units of uh, data and facts, right? Uh, so the, the sun rises on the other side of the river. It's a fact. It's a data. And uh, that's, that's the knowledge you have as, as, as some kind of uh, uh, primordial uh, human. Then rational knowledge would, uh, would be uh, operating on, in units of rules and principles uh, that sun rotates around the earth because it comes on that side of the river and goes on the other side. So that's, that's the principle, that's the rule. It's always that way. And of course, it's also wrong. Uh, and then creative knowledge is when the units of knowledge is concepts and uh, categories. And that's where the understanding is. When we understand something rather than we know how to describe it, even if we describe it in a way that's accurate, but uh, ultimately wrong. Example of these three levels would be, uh, my favorite example is notch pathway. We can operate in facts that notch signal promotes epidermal, let's say, differentiation inhibits neuronal differentiation. Um, and then you can replace epidermal and neuronal with hundreds and hundreds of examples you can find in literature uh, that notch inhibits one pathway, activates another pathway. So the general principle would be that notch pathway promotes one cell fate uh, while inhibiting alternative cell fate. That's a principle, and then you can plug in a lot of examples. But the concept behind it is much, much more general. And the concept is that what Notch Pathway does, it's an, it exemplifies a very general and deep principle, which is that it converts stochastic fluctuations, in this case, in the level of expression of Notch and its ligand, uh, into deterministic outcomes, uh, uh, for example, self-fate decisions. And the way it does it is by amplifying noise. So noise here is necessary. And noise is amplified by positive feedback, and you go from stochastic to deterministic uh, phase. And that transition from stochastic to deterministic governs a lot of uh, phenomena in the world, from formation of galaxies to formation of cities to the way that people uh, make opinions and so forth. And the next point I want to make is that the, uh, what would be the, the way that one tries to not to be wrong in science? Um, in math and physics, they say, well, if the theory, the, you know, if theory sounds kind of ugly, if the equation looks ugly, it's probably wrong. It has to be elegant. It has to be, to be, to be right. It has to be beautiful. In biology, we cannot use that because... Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not a usable uh, principle. But what we can use is, uh, we, for us, what's the guiding principle is uh, evolutionary theory. But more, more fundamentally, I think it's uh, simplicity. That if something is not simple enough, it's probably wrong. And my, my favorite uh, visual to illustrate it is this series of painting by Pablo Picasso, uh, Bull, uh, where it goes from detailed images and down to that last image over there, which captures the essence of the bull. And that's the mental exercise that I think is incredibly useful in trying to uh, grasp the understanding of complex biology. And that's where I think the, there is always, uh, there's often a confusion about when you try to simplify something, uh, generally, I would say people who don't have deep understanding, they would say, oh, it's more complicated than that. Uh, of course, everything is more complicated than anything, but the point is that uh, there's difference between simple and simplistic. And so I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. The simple is the good. Remove anything that's non-essential. The bad is simplistic when you remove something essential. And the ugly, of course, when you add something non-essential, and that's complicated. And there's a lot of things in biology that are complicated because they have a lot of non-essential 
components, uh, non-essential data, non-essential facts or whatever, measurements, uh, and non-essential components in our thinking and understanding them. So what I will try to do in the rest of the talk is uh, quickly go over these three themes uh, that are capture a lot of what 4DCD is about. Uh, I'm sure it's way too ambitious than uh, that this time I have. I'll probably skip one or two of them, uh, but I'll try to go through. I, I want to get to the last one in particular. So in tissue biology, what are the major unknowns? Tissue biology, I think, is uh, one of the fields in modern biology that is way behind in terms of understanding compared to genetics, biochemistry, cell biology, physiology, population biology, and so on. It's way behind all of the other fields. And it's not because we don't have enough data. We have lots of data in tissue biology. There, and, and now, in the last five, 10 years, we have a lot more data because of single cell sequencing, because of imaging. We accumulate more and more data. But we still don't know very basic questions, uh, answers to ba basic questions, like what are the design principles of tissue organization? Are different tissues variations on some theme the way that different cell types are? Or are there, uh, what are the uh, principles of tissue architecture? What, what are the guiding principles of how tissues are organized in different organisms? And what are the, you know, modular organization is a very common theme in biology. What are the modules or minimal units of organization of tissues? We don't know the answers. Are different cell types equivalent in terms of their roles in tissue organization and function? We just use the notion of cell type, for example, or cell state sometimes, uh, but is that enough? And we know that it's often not enough because some cells form some equivalence groups where they belong to the same category, but they're different cell types. And it's not a random assortment of what would be an equivalence group. And what are the types of relations between different cell categories and so on? And I'm channeling Jerry Seinfeld here, what's the deal with ECM? So this is something we understand the list. Uh, I guess a lot of people here are too young to know about Seinfeld show. But, so the, but the ECM, I would say, is one of the hardest problems, uh, even for empirical knowledge, uh, because of the complexity and lack of sort of appropriate conceptual framework for understanding it. So in terms of tissue organization, so what I wanted to illustrate with this picture is you look at different tissues and ask, uh, what, is there something in common? Are they all kind of, uh, they all follow the same developmental principles. They all have to solve the same problems of having appropriate cell composition, appropriate cell numbers, uh, appropriate spatial arrangement. All of them have to solve that problem, all tissues. But they look very different. And that difference kind of belies these underlying simple principles that have been solved once in evolution. As we know, evolution solves the problem once, and then it uses some variations on that solution. And we don't know what that uh, solution is. And uh, instead, we have sort of a textbook picture like this. And uh, here we, uh, again, this is where we can have a lot of data and very little understanding of uh, why it is the way it is. Understanding is really about the why question. Uh, why these cells, these particular cell types in these particular numbers, locations, uh, in particular tissue, and so forth. What's the relation between them? Are they all the same or not? And we know they're not all the same. Some of them you can remove, you still have tissue. And some of them you remove and tissue collapses, like lymphocyte versus fibroblasts, right? So they're not equivalent. So that means there's some kind of a hierarchy. Some are more important than others not for specific functionality, but for the architecture. And we don't know what, uh, what that hierarchy is. We do know that probably the most primordial organization is epithelium mesenchymal because all metazoans, even the simplest ones that don't have any other cell types, always have epithelium mesenchymal component. That module is probably the most ancient, and most fundamental. And it's also the module that governs much of development, as we know. Epithelium mesenchymal interaction through exchange of growth factors governs these interactions. And this interaction is asymmetric in the sense that information flow goes from mesenchymal cells to epithelial cells because mesenchymal cells possess positional information. Epithelial cells have several fate choices, the choice dictated by mesenchymal cells. Okay, so that's something we know. 
But can we generalize this? Because we can say, well, mesenchymal cells, and let's call them just uh, to abstract from specific type of cell or shape of cell, let's call them M cells, and we define them as cells that have some information. And let's call epithelial cells E cells, the cells that have several choices, fate choices. And then M cell dictates the choice of fate by E cell. And that would be a general principle, and we know several examples. So dermal and epidermal, that classical example from developmental biology, where derm is defined, uh, de uh, uh, determines the fate of epidermis, like making different appendages. Then niche cells and stem cells also follow that paradigm. Niche cells have some information that dictates several fates of stem cells, renewal, proliferation, differentiation into different types. In immunology, dendritic cells have information about the pathogen they encounter, T cells, naive T cells have several fate choices. They can become different effectors, and dendritic cells dictate which type of effector they will be. And in homeostatic circuits, sensor cells have some information about whatever regulated variable they detected, and they control the activity of effector cells. So in all cases, there's the same type of relation based on information flow from one cell to another. In terms of modules of organization, I mentioned already epithelial mesenchymal would be the most primitive one. Uh, but as complexity of animals increased and new cell types developed, uh, what happened was that, of course, now there are many different types of cells that take place of epithelial cells, meaning that cells that now we define them not in terms of morphology or in terms of uh, uh, you know, specific function, but it would be cells that are responsible for primary function of the tissue. For in every tissue in vertebrates now, we can say there is a cell Right here, this is a tissue-specific cell type responsible for core function of that tissue, like intestinal epithelium in the gut, neuron in the brain, and so forth. But then there is always these three other cell types, uh, uh, microvascular endothelial cells, uh, stromal cells, and tissue resin macrophages. And that seems to be uni uh, uh, a universal feature of organization in terms of minimal composition of tissues. On top of it, you can add other things. You can add lymphocytes, you can add adipocytes in some tissues and so forth. But that would be the foundational for cell types, at least in my opinion. And, and what is uh, important here is that these three cell types, uh, endothelial, stromal, and macrophage, they're not responsible for the primary function of the tissue. But what they necessary is to perform supportive function, either delivery of nutrients and oxygen, uh, production of matrix and growth factors, removal of debris, homeostasis, and so forth. And these three cell types are all of mesodermal origin. So this is, I think, is a reflection of this ancient division between epithelial and mesenchymal types or categories of cells. Um, and, uh, and as I said, that these three cell types perform uh, supportive function, whereas the other cell type performs the primary function of the tissue. And that could be epithelium, it could be neuron, it could be any, anything else. So in the brain, you see the same kind of basic architecture, of course. And the next question I want to talk about tissue homeostasis because it's really a key uh, problem in uh, biology, I would say now, for understanding not only the basic questions, but also many diseases at the tissue level. Note that diseases at tissue level, which is diseases like fibrotic, neoplastic, and degenerative disease, these are the hardest one currently. These are the intractable diseases. And the reason for that, I think, is because we don't know what the basic tissue biology is. We don't know what the normal counterpart is for this. Every disease has some normal counterpart. And because of that, our knowledge is so much more limited about it. So with cancer cell biology, which is different from neo Plasia at the tissue level. In cancer cell biology, because we know basic biology of cell cycle control, signaling, and so forth, we, ha we have that understanding. But at the level of tissues, we don't. And homeostasis is, uh, of course, is a very fundamental concept uh, across different levels of uh, biological organization. But at, at the cellular level, we understand it fairly well. At systems level, we understand it essentially since 1929 when Walter Cannon first published his review paper on homeostasis. He basically captured all key features, remarkably. Uh, 
But at the tissue level, we don't know what it is. Even though the term tissue homeostasis probably, uh, there are probably hundreds of thousands of papers using that term without defining what that is. And I'll just use that as an example uh, to say that, uh, well, first the definition is that st uh, homeostasis is about stability of some state variables of a system, whether it's a room temperature, potassium concentration, glucose concentration, or whatever you want to keep stable. And not all state variables need to be homeostatically maintained. So that, that's also important to know because not everything has to be maintained homeostatically. Only some things are, and these are regulated variables, the ones that the system cares about. And that requires two components. There, there, there needs to be a sensor to monitor the value of regulated variable if it's too high or too low. And there needs to be a component that can change that value, if the effector part that can change it up or down if it deviates from set point. And uh, of course, the, the general idea is uh, very universal. It goes, it's, it's a basic of basics of control theory. It goes from engineered systems. So you can have thermostat, room temperature control, or airplanes, and so forth. Uh, at systemic level, it would be well-characterized pathways, like sensing glucose by uh, sensors. In this case, would be endocrine cells or brainstem. And uh, at the tissue level, it often would be macrophages, for example, that would be sensors for some tissue homeostatic variables, like oxygen level, and they will sense it, and instead of hormone, they will produce some paracrine signal like VEGF. And that in all cases, the signal produced by sensor will act on some kind of an effector, like hepatocyte, thermostat, or endothelial cell, and the point of it is to change the value of regulated variable in the right direction. The reason I'm telling you all this, because you, I'm sure you're all familiar with these notions, I'm telling you all this because we don't know what regulated variables are for tissues. And that is a very basic, fundamental question. And the reason we don't know it is not because we're limited by technologies or by anything like that. It's just we don't know them because it hasn't been systematically studied. The question hasn't been really asked. And uh, uh, with the exceptions of some specific examples where it was asked because of some other reason, not because people cared about tissue homeostasis. And this is examples of uh, some of the regulated variables that are likely to be uh, part of tissue homeostasis. So I will uh, now just finish with, I will skip uh, a few steps and I will finish with uh, one last point that I wanted to make, which is about uh, fundamental gaps in our understanding. And that has to do with uh, complex system perspective in the last uh, minute. Um, this, I think, is uh, one of the uh, major limitations in understanding in biology specifically, not in physics, not in social sciences, but in biology. It has been, it came out of physics, it has been embraced by economics and, and social sciences, sociology, but it hasn't been embraced yet by biologists to the extent it deserves and is necessary. So complex system perspective basically can be summarized that the complex system is a, a new system that has enough of components or agents that make up the system, elements of the system, they have to be diverse and interconnected, and they have to influence each other. And if you have these requirements, you have a complex system. Uh, so we here are a complex system, for example, uh, and any social system is complex system. Uh, if we leave the room and you have a system with chairs in the room, that's not a complex system because there's no interaction between components. The interactions between components typically follow a small number of simple rules. And that's what's the most counterintuitive about complexity, because complexity is governed by a small number of simple rules. But the type of complexity it can generate is almost unlimited. And much of what we see as very intractable problems in biology is the consequence of execution of the simple rules. And no matter how much we study the consequence, we will never understand the system unless we know what the underlying simple rules are. And uh, the consequence, again, of these interactions is both complex and unpredictable. And of course, examples we're all familiar with, with school of fish or uh, flock of 
birds that form these very complex patterns. If you try to understand that by studying individual fish or birds, you can study them up to a zoo, you can single cell sequence them, you can do all sorts of imaging, dynamic Im You can do anything you want, you will never understand how you form that. Um, however, if you study how the individual organisms interact with each other to produce this, turns out there are only two or three simple rules in both cases. Fly not too far, not too close to your neighbors, and fly in the direction of average vector of your neighbors. Those two rules, if they follow it, and you can simulate it, and you produce these types of structures. So imagine if you know those rules, how much more understanding you have about the system compared to if you try to observe this, measure it, and do all kinds of data generating exercises. You will never understand it. And, and that's what is counterintuitive, and that's what really needs to be embraced. And uh, one last point I would make is that uh, about fundamental gaps in knowledge and understanding. And it has to do also with a concept from complexity science that has to do with levels of organization. These shapes of the birds and the flocks of birds and skull of fish, they're what's called emergent properties. Right? They emerge from the interaction of the individual components. Each uh, level of interaction between components generates emergent properties that generates next level of interaction. So cells form tissues and tissues interact, form organs and, and so forth. And so we can say that atoms interact according to rules of chemistry. They make molecules. Molecules interact according to rules of polymers, make macromolecules. Uh, individuals are agents that form social groups. Social groups interact to make societies. Those are individual levels of organization. And uh, the reason I'm mentioning it is, this is my last slide, is that fundamental gaps of knowledge come when there are missing levels of organization, missing many from our understanding. So we know that atoms interact by chemical rules to form molecules. Molecules interact by weak interaction, uh, by making polymers, macromolecules, they interact through weak interactions to make macromolecular complexes, and then what? And then at some point you have a cell, but we can probably all agree that you don't jump from macromolecular complexes directly to cells. There is a missing level of organization that is an emergent property of interaction of macromolecular complexes. And we don't, actually don't even know how many of those levels are missing. And that's the biology. When you look at it, when you find it in your studies, that's what gives you this sense of kind of awe that you know, oh, this is something magical and how do they know to do that, to, know, to go there, to form that. Uh, and, and that's where we have fundamental gaps, meaning there, no matter, what, no matter how much information or data you have about it, you will never understand it. Because what we need to understand is what generates this level of organization, which is an emergent property and consequence of interaction of components at the previous level. The same goes with cells. We probably don't jump directly from cells to tissue. There is an intermediate level or levels of organization, and we don't know what they are. And that's why we don't understand tissue biology. And the same goes for other levels. And I'll stop here, and I'll uh, uh, finish with this quote, and happy to take questions. I actually just curious about your thoughts on, you know, extracting these principles, rules, and understanding biology, and in a relationship with, you know, the biomedical research. A lot of us, like, you know, when we're working on something, like people, in, like, at the beginning, interested in biology. A lot of them, like, interested in disease and want to, you know, help patients, help family members, even to feel better. Yeah, uh, just wonder how to. What's your thought on? the relationship with between these two different concepts. You mean between the type of research we normally do and the concepts of this? Well, 
I, I try to be very careful not to present it in a way that is uh, negative about any type of science. I'm just trying to say, well, these are the types of science. Right? These are the types of question, type of research. And again, the distribution of different efforts in different areas. Uh, at equilibrium, it's optimal, right? You don't need like 100 Einsteins, right? Uh, or you don't need only people who only synthesize everything and write textbooks, but nobody generate knowledge. The fact that 90% is about generating empirical knowledge is the necessary fact. And that's what the bread and butter of science is. Um, but when one of the fields becomes dominant in the absence of others, then it creates tensions. Then it creates situations where we may have a lot of data, but we, we don't understand what it means. Frankly, I think in the last five years, uh, Many papers, I think probably majority of papers you read in major journals, there's lots of very nice data, but you don't know what you did just learn, right, after reading it. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's valuable to have this data, but I'm saying that that by itself is not enough. And that goes for anything, disease or basic biology. It's, it's uh, in, in every field. Uh, we need to have the right balance between them. Bruce, on that, I really thought provoking. I, I really like this idea of the of the importance of understanding the simple rules that that govern. How do you see the interface between that and empirical data? You know, do you have to have the empirical data to then learn the simple rules, and then? Do you test those simple rules against more empirical data? How, what's the relationship between the acquisition, the, the learning of the simple rules, and the observational data? Yeah, I, I think initially you have observational data. right? You, that's where you start always. Um, and well, at least until recently, when you can, through computer simulation, get something very surprising and interesting, and then ask, is, does it exist in, in real world? But, but normally, it comes from observational data initially. We see this flocks of birds. It's a really enigmatic, beautiful, mysterious. We want to understand it. Uh, but then, that's where the uh, question becomes, how do you go about it? Do you just measure their speeds, trajectories, dynamics of shape change? It would be totally useless information. Not to mention, extremely complicated to do that. Or you can try to understand what's underlying simple principle. And this is, again, I say, I'm emphasizing this. What's very non-intuitive is that to generate that type of very complex behaviors, this very uh, intricate emergent patterns and so forth, to generate it, it's enough to have a few simple rules. Often it would be just a, a couple of rules, but what creates complexity is iteration of those rules. And, and, and so you start with empirical observations. And then uh, if it is a complex system, invariably you need to get down to understanding what are the governing rules. And it's always, it's, it's very universal. You have components of the system. You have to define them first. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes not. You have to define what the components are. And then you define the rules of their interactions. How you go about it, you go back to basic sort of the way we do experiments. You perturb it in a way, in, with some uh, hypothesis-driven way that you think what might affect it. When people figured out how birds make these murmurations, they didn't try like random things. They tried things that they thought would matter. The same we do with our experimental system. We choose things that we think are likely to matter. We apply that, those perturbations, see the outcome, and then see if this outcome affects other agents and so forth, and go from there. Um, so in the beginning, you said that um, we can use, hello, um, we can use as guidance whether or not a biological theory is, is likely to be true. We can use simplicity. And, and you mentioned a couple of times that the rules underlying emergence are simple. But I mean, I don't understand where this comes from. Like why do the rules have to be simple? They could also be very complex and complicated. Could it be that it's just us that we, we can only understand 
or comprehend simple concepts as, as humans. And, and that's why the rules have to be simple. Well, the reason they are simple is because that's what keeps, uh, because that's what people find when they try to understand the rules. The reason they're simple in biology, let's say, that if you can achieve something with sim by simpler means, there would be no reason, no pressure to, evolutionary pressure to create something more complex, more complicated. So if the simple principle is sufficient, that would be selected. Anything you add to it that doesn't uh, 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 serve any additional function would not be selected. But but general answer is that that's what surprise. This was a surprise when this was realized that uh, uh, when people studied complex system initially in physics, in social insects, in societies, that the rules of interaction between components generally not only simple but there are very few rules are sufficient to generate something very complex. This is not to say that everything would be just two or three rules. Of course. Uh, I skip a, a lot of uh, additional aspects here where the way that the rules themselves interact and so forth. But generally what people find is that a few simple rules are sufficient. And this is even became a concept in complexity science, sim a, few sim a few simple rules. That's kind of a mantra that surprisingly explains a lot of complexity. Yeah, so it's very, very stimulating talk, thank you. So I've tried to connect what you mentioned at the beginning, the fourth stage of development, and at the end, the fundamental gaps. So you think where we are, like of when we try to go from the micromolecule complex to cells, are we missing the new paradigm, or we are missing new tools? Um, so I... So I think for, it, it depends on the field. So let's say in the field of tissue biology, I think we're missing new paradigms. We, we are missing conceptual framework, for sure. Um, do we still miss, are we still missing some data? Yeah, probably in areas where it's really hard, like ECM. Uh, it's a very hard question and we still, we, we don't have probably enough data there yet. But we probably have enough for developing some conceptual framework. Um, so in every field, and when I say, when I divide it this way, of course, it's a, we have to think about it on, on different scales, right? Uh, on the scale of the entire tissue biology or on the scale of uh, some specific problems in tissue biology. Uh, but generally, I would say the conceptual framework is what's limiting because it's missing in, in tissue biology. It's not the case for physiology, it's not the case for molecular cell biology, and uh, not the case meaning currently. Of course, a few years from now, we'll realize, oh, we got it all wrong, and the uh, genome is actually not doing what we thought it's doing, I'm sure. Um, but, but yeah, it, I think in, in the case of tissue biology, currently it's conceptual framework that's missing. We have, um, yeah. So yeah. we have a, a few this questions. Our last, from, yeah, a few yeah. questions from online. But I, I'm just going to hit um, one or two of them. I, I think that you just answered this one. Someone was asking, um, "What do you think is most needed to find the missing intermediate levels of organization? Is this new paradigms, new tools?" Okay. Um, yeah. So, so that uh, so I only answered for tissue biology, but generally, uh, what what's needed is that when we know. Uh, a given level of organization. So for cell biology, I would say it probably would be some macromolecular complexes. That's the highest level we know how you get to it, right? So you define it by knowing what the pre uh, 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 previous level is. From atoms, molecules, from molecules, macromolecules, from there some complexes, from there some supramolecular complexes, or some other type of entity that will become the agent at that level of organization. And then after that, we don't know what the next level is, and then boom, we have a cell. So clearly there's something in between missing. And the way you go about it is the previous level that is known, you try to understand what are the rules of interaction between components at that level that generate something else that we don't even know what that is. We cannot describe it. Like we don't know what the modules of tissue organization are, for example, or in neuroscience, of course, there's a big uh, sort of conceptual uh, 
shift has been going from neurons to neural circuits. But between neural circuits and the entire brain, what are the additional levels of organization? And so one has to ask then how the known components interact to generate something at the next level. Um, let me just um, add this one question. Um, is there a good way or maybe an ideal way to determine the right or the minimum number of actors or cells and the, number of, and the rules in determining the behavior of any given system? There is no known way to determine minimal number of agents. So this is one of the things in complexity theory where, uh, where people who work in that theory, they realize and they're not happy about it, that you cannot, it, the definition, there is this vagueness in definition, which I mentioned that complex system is a system with many interacting components, but how many is enough? That's not known. Um, it's known that if you don't have enough, you don't have complexity, complex behaviors. If you have enough, you do, but what is the, de defines the threshold? That generally is not known. Um, and uh, uh, the, the other parameters that define complexity is that they need to be interdependent. And in many cases, there needs to be some diversity of types, that the agents cannot all be the same. There has to be some diversity of types. Um, but yeah, how many, what's the minimal number of agents, for example, that's generally is not known. There's no known sort of magic number. All right, I think um, we're gonna be, after this session, we're all going over to Bob's for drinks. So uh, I'm sure there's a lot of more discussion that we can have related to um, Ruslan's really very stimulating, thought-provoking talk. Um, I now want to introduce, come on, uh, come on up, Vamsi, our next speaker. And I think this is really perfect because one of the things that Ruslan really didn't talk about, which is energy, bioenergetics. Um, basically, um, the role of bioenergetics in coordinating all of these different, you know, levels of organization. And that's what we're going to be hearing, I think, uh, from uh, Vamsi, who uh, I'll just very quickly say he's from Harvard Medical School. He's a Howard Hughes investigator. Um, he has really played a huge role in uh, really characterizing mitochondria, their proteome. Uh, mitochondria are, you know, a core endosymbiont of the eukaryotic cell that really regulates all kinds of metabolic uh, systems. And it could be that those systems are the missing link to some of the pathways that we saw. Um, so why don't you take it over? <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, uh, Janine, for organizing uh, an amazing conference. Thank you, Ron and uh, Jennifer, for the invitation to come and uh, participate. Uh, I will say that uh, during dinner, uh, I was uh, sitting next to Jennifer, and she turns to me at the end of dinner, and she asks me, what's the worst talk you've ever given? <laughs> like, why are you asking me that right before I'm about to give this presentation? So my answer is, I hope it's not the talk I'm about to give. Um, so um, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to be uh, participating in this uh, workshop, and I'm really looking forward to meeting a lot of you. I know a small subset of you, but really over the next few days, I'm looking forward to meeting many of you and talking science. And um, the, the core of uh, what I want to talk about is the concept of causality in uh, metabolism. I actually think that metabolism, metabolic homeostasis, is a really fine, classy problem for all of 4DCP. Uh, but then within there, how do we actually distinguish correlation from causality? And um, uh, I'm gonna begin by just introducing uh, a little bit of uh, who I am, my group, and what we focus on. And then I'm gonna try to present some of the problems that we have pursued in the past in context of some of the challenges for DCP. So this is the group I am super proud of. I am looking forward to being able to get together and update this photograph so you can actually see everyone's faces, but this is my awesome team. This is what we focus on uh, in Ruslan. The answer is organelles, that key level of organization between macromolecular complexes and the cell or organelles. And so my favorite organelle is the mitochondrion. This is a spectacular organelle that looks like an intercellular bacteria because one and a half billion years ago, it was a free swimming bacteria. It still retains a vestige of its bacterial ancestry. It has a tiny genome that encodes only 13 proteins total. And all 13 of those proteins 
are a part of these five macromolecular complexes, the OXFOS complexes. There's more than 90 different proteins, 13 of which are maternally inherited. And the others come from both mom and dad. And so uh, half our lab is very interested in this very unique evolutionary history, the coordination of two genomes, and the biochemical compartmentalization that has to take place. But the other half of our lab is very interested in, in what happens when mitochondria break down. And uh, as it turns out, it's going to break down in all of us. Um, and so this is a, a, a figure from uh, a paper from Ian Trounce. What the Crowns group did is they biopsied skeletal muscle from individuals of different ages. They purified mitochondria, put them into a cuvette, and they measured rates of respiration. And what you can see is that the slope goes down. And in fact, this actually underestimates this problem because this is normalized for the number of mitochondria. And the actual, I mean, this is normalized to mitochondria, and the actual number of mitochondria declines. And so, uh, that's the problem, uh, and exercise actually sends us back up again. Now, the billion-dollar question in the aging field is cause and effect. Does this decline actually drive age-associated pathology, or do you have sick tissues, so you have sick mitochondria? Now, at the opposite end of the extreme are a very large number of individually rare genetic disorders. These are basically pediatric disorders where children are born with defects in the mitochondria, and there's no doubt that the Mitochondrial pathology is causal for end organ pathology. Uh, and these are devastating disorders. And this is what we've, we've historically uh, investigated with the hope that they'll teach us more broadly about organelle homeostasis uh, and uh, 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 pathogenesis. Now, I want to just introduce these rare diseases because I actually do think that for 4DCP, I, I love the idea that 4DCP, that P could actually mean pathophysiology as opposed to physiology. There's so much that you can learn by studying disease, especially genetic disease, because you know what that root genetic defect is. And I just want to illustrate the complexity over here, right? Because uh, there's now 150 different genetic forms of uh, OxFOS deficiency. So this is oxidative phosphorylation. We have 150 different genes that are known to be mutated that proximally impact the system. Uh, but I want to just underscore how challenging this is, OK? Um, we have some patients that have a mutation in this subunit, and the name of that subunit is not important, but when you have a mutation in that subunit, this patient is typically gonna be a male, and in his 40s, is gonna wake up one morning and be suddenly blind. And this is the only phenotype in that particular patient, okay? So a relatively mild mitochondrial defect. You have another patient that has a mutation in that subunit, like literally the neighboring subunit, both are bacterially conserved, okay? And uh, that particular patient is gonna have every single one of the symptoms shown here. Cardiomyopathy, deep gray matter lesions, uh, sideroblastic anemias, myopathies, and the eye disease. And as far as we can tell, okay, the mutation resides in a complex and it's exact same function, right? It's proton pumping and uh, electron transfer. So this is remarkable amount of pleiotropy. We do not understand how defects in a complex that we understand really well propagate out to all of these different diseases. This is, this is, this is a complex system. And so I actually think that a really nice 4DCP challenge, just very broadly speaking, is how do root genetic defects lead to end organ pathology? It's sort of a, a broad challenge. And uh, in our case, we have 150 different ways that this respiratory chain and OXFA system can break to give rise to uh, this uh, broad spectrum of pathologies. Okay? And we understand this pretty well. This, this has been the target of multiple Nobel Prizes over, over the years. Uh, uh, Peter Mitchell and uh, uh, John Walker and Paul Boyer, multiple Nobel Prizes have been awarded to how this stuff works. Okay? So, we know that when this thing is broken genetically, it's gonna immediately lead to a decrease in ATP, an elevation in NADH, uh, a collapse of the membrane potential, ROS, calcium dyshomeostasis. So we, we, we know that, but how the heck do we now connect even those proximal defects to what we see in these patients at the end of the day? Very complicated, okay? And uh, this is, uh, I wanted to share with you a little bit of our work trying to understand this challenge. And I actually think that this is an area where Janelians and the 4DCP community can really help us. So 
we've been using uh, a technology called metabolomics, right? And uh, we can use what's called tandem mass spectrometry. We can measure literally uh, uh, thousands of metabolites in the bloodstream. So right now, from a spoonful of plasma, we can quantify about 10,000 peaks. We only know the identity of about 1,000 of those peaks, which is kind of cool. So there's this open question of what those other 9,000 peaks are. Uh, and then uh, what we've been doing is applying it to cells and mouse models and humans with mitochondrial disease just to see what we observe. We could have expected to see changes in ATP or things that reflect uh, ATP deficiency. We could have seen signatures of ROS, but over multiple, multiple studies, if you kind of boil it down, the main principal component corresponding to the major changes uh, in, in the plasma uh, is, is, is an elevated NADH ratio. And we're calling this reductive stress, a pileup of electrons. And so a lot of the circulating metabolites that we see can somehow be traced immediately back to a high NADH, NAD ratio. So why is that happening? When the respiratory chain, so recall that the respiratory chain is gonna transfer electrons from NADH uh, to uh, the chain, protons are gonna get pumped, and then that's gonna then create a gradient that catalyzes the formation of ATP. Now, when you throw a wrench into the system because of any of those 150 different genetic diseases, uh, a lot of things happen. What, what we see is happening in these patients is uh, a high uh, uh, NADH NAD ratio. And so this NADH piles up in the mitochondrion. When it piles up, it becomes high in the cytosol. And then when it's high in the cytosol, enzymes that will use NADH will oxidize it. Uh, and then uh, release uh, a reduced product, in this case, lactate, and that ends up in the bloodstream. And so lactate, and there's another molecule called alpha hydroxybutyrate. This is like a lactate, has an extra carbon. It can also be used by the LDH enzyme. That also spills out. So in these patients, we're seeing very high levels of lactate and alpha hydroxybutyrate that are reflecting too many electrons. Okay? So this is what we observe. Okay, We could have seen high uh, def ATP deficiency signatures, we could have seen raw signatures, but what we're seeing is high NADH, NAD ratio. So now, one of the things that we would like to know, okay, is, is this simply a marker or is this a driver of disease? And um, why is this important? So I I'd like for everyone to participate. Raise your hand if you know that LDL is bad. Good. Okay. Uh, now, raise your hand if you know that HDL is good. Okay, good. Now, what if I have a drug that drops LDL? Is that gonna be good for you? Raise your hand if, if, if the answer is yes. If you have an LDL lowering drug, is that favorable? Yeah. Now, how about if you have a drug that boosts HDL? Should be good, right? So as it turns out, LDL is a causal biomarker, it, it is, it, it's a bad biomarker. However, it's in the causal path to cardiovascular disease and stroke. HDL, however, is simply a biomarker. If you have a drug that actually boosts HDL, it does not save lives. Two pharma companies have done randomized control trials and actually shown that it doesn't work. You can also use a human genetics technique called RIP Mendelian randomization. You can actually show using that formal approach that it's not in the causal path. And so it's useful to know if a particular measurement is in the causal path for some outcome variable, whether it is a disease or whether it's a physiological phenotype. And so in the world of metabolism, almost everything we have done historically is purely observational. A glucometer, you're gonna get a glucose measurement. You can do really fancy metabolomics. Maybe you can do 10,000 or 20,000 metabolites, still observational. Let's do some really fancy fluxomics using C13 uh, carbon labeling. It's an observation, right? Um, what we'd love to be able to do is to evaluate causality. And the way you do it in, in human biology, say in the world of medicine, is you use genetics or you use a drug perturbation. You give a drug or a kid is born with a particular genetic defect, so you know that that particular mutation is, 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 is causally upstream of what you observe. What we need uh, are beyond you know, those two uh, limited approaches for, for, for human medicine. We need new tools for evaluating causality and metabolism. And we have just now begun to try to delve into this space by developing some tools, but I think this is a space where Janelia could be amazing. 
Okay, so I told you earlier that when the respiratory chain is broken, the NADH piles up, this spills over into the cytosol. We observe this, but is this causal? So uh, I spent a lot of time on the following animation, so please, please watch really closely, ready? My dream is to be able to have that NADH and just make it go away, right? So, so what I want is I want something like a pencil eraser, right, that will just erase that NADH reductive stress. That, so uh, what we did is we kind of did what the folks in the CRISPR land did as they borrowed an enzyme from bacteria that can now manipulate the genome. Or the optogenetics folks, they borrow a bacterial enzyme and now, now they manipulate neural circuitry. So we're gonna take a bacterial enzyme. Uh, it's a water-forming NADH oxidase. It's gonna do the four electron reduction of oxygen using two molecules of NADH. The side product is water. We can express that in the cytosol. We can eliminate this high NADH-NAD ratio. We can put a mitoliter sequence and we can send it into the mitochondrion as well. Uh, and so we screened uh, multiple water-forming NADH oxidases. We liked this one uh, uh, from Lactobacillus brevis. Uh, this is a reaction that it performs in a test tube. It's very specific for NADH over NADPH, which has a nearly identical midpoint potential. Uh, 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 and so we, we, we didn't want it to cross-react. And, and then it's functional in cells. Cells can actually tolerate expression of this bacterial enzyme and it'll, it'll change the NADH NAD ratio. So um, now can we rescue mito disease in a dish uh, uh, using this approach? And so we can poison the mitochondrion with a small molecule. And when you do that, you're gonna see a proliferative defect. And now we can come in with uh, this LB Nox and then see what happens. Uh, and we can actually rescue proliferation, at least in the dish, right? And we can poison the mitochondrion in other ways. We can block uh, mtDNA replication. We can block the translation off of the mitochondrial ribosome. Uh, uh, we can add a poison elsewhere. In all of these instances, we see some type of a proliferative defect. This is just a cell in a dish. But when we come in with this bacterial enzyme, we, we, we rescue either fully or to a large extent the proliferative defects in a dish. Uh, and so rescuing something in a dish is totally different than rescuing an entire animal. So, um, um, but it's, it, it's a first step. And so we're excited about this type of a technology for perturbing NADH, NAD. Um, we solved its crystal structure. Um, and when we do the kinetics on, on this enzyme, like I said earlier, it's very specific for NADH. This is naturally occurring. But because we understand how enzymes bind to NADH, uh, and we know what uh, NADPH binding sites look like also, we wanted to create an analogous tool for NADPH. And so we created a uh, quintuple mutant uh, by considering the Rossman fold and the dinucleotide binding uh, motifs. And what we were able to do was to create what we're calling triphosphopyridine nucleotide oxidase. So that's uh, TPNH was the classical name for NADPH, and so uh, sort of we're paying obeisances to that old uh, classical name. We call this TPNOX. Now this actually conducts a reaction that is not known to exist naturally. Right? This is a uh, perfectly uh, NADPH-specific water-forming uh, uh, NADPH oxidase. So this, this reaction with this level of specificity does not exist. Uh, and if you look at the uh, KM for LB NOx and TP NOx for NADH versus NADPH, you'll see that they have swapped. And if you look at the uh, KCATs, you'll see that uh, they have swapped. And so this is, uh, the, the engineered enzyme is as good for NADPH as the naturally occurring enzyme is for NADH. Uh, and so uh, we're not traditionally tool builders, but we've really gotten excited about trying to develop at least first generation uh, technologies. We've made these available. Uh, I was really excited when uh, LB Knox became uh, red hot on adgene, only then to discover that red is not the highest category, blue is actually the highest category in adgene. So a lot of labs are using the LB Knox technology and uh, the, the TP Knox technology, but these are just first generation tools um, and, and they could be improved. And uh, uh, I think it'd be great to be able to uh, tickle somebody at Genelia to, to work on these problems. Um, Russ Goodman is a hepatologist in our laboratory. He's very, very, very uh, interested in 
uh, liver uh, biology, hepatic homeostasis. Uh, and he asked the question of whether this technology could be taken in vivo. And what I'll say is that molecule alpha hydroxybutyrate, this is not beta hydroxybutyrate. Beta hydroxybutyrate is what you're measuring when you're looking at uh, your ketones if you're on the Atkins diet. Alpha hydroxybutyrate is an intermediate in what's called the transsulfuration pathway. It's a very obscure metabolite. And that was our, our number one marker in these rare mitochondrial diseases where we see this reductive stress. Now, um, as it turns out, alpha hydroxybutyrate is also the strongest circulating marker of what's called the metabolic syndrome. This is classically uh, the insulin resistance, high cholesterol metabolic syndrome. Uh, and this is the number one marker. And when patients undergo weight loss surgery, which is known to improve insulin resistance, this thing plummets super, super fast. Number one marker that drops following weight loss surgery, which is actually known to improve insulin sensitivity. And so we wanted to just confirm uh, that in vivo alpha hydroxybutyrate is indeed a marker of this NADH NAD ratio. And that what Russ did was he delivered by uh, uh, adenovirus tailing injection, LB Nox. Uh, it's going to get taken up into the liver. And what's really cool about the liver is uh, LB Nox will make the NADH NAD go down, but a, a very nice way of actually boosting NADH NAD in the liver is to give ethanol because of the alcohol dehydrogenase enzymes in the liver. So it's a great way to send up that ratio. And so what he's able to do now is he's able to send up the NADH NAD ratio with uh, ethanol, and then that gets brought back down again by having LB Nox on board. Uh, we see this alpha hydroxybutyrate, which was observed in humans with the metabolic syndrome and the mitochondrial diseases being elevated. It goes up and then the circulating alpha hydroxybutyrate is also up. And so that's a complicated way of saying that this marker, which is the number one marker of insulin resistance uh, and metabolic syndrome, appears to be a marker of the hepatic uh, NADH NAD ratio. So now what happens to glucose homeostasis if this is on board? And so what Russ is able to do is to put mice onto a high fat diet, which will give the mouse uh, insulin resistance, and you can quantify insulin resistance based on what's called a glucose area under the curve. You give a bolus of glucose, uh, the animal is going to try to defend its glucose levels, and the area under the curve ends up being a proxy for how well it's doing. And what you can see is that when the mouse is on a high fat diet, the area under the curve is high, but when this LB Nox is on board to basically erase that high NADH NAD ratio, uh, we can bring it back down again. And so this appears to be. Uh, in the causal path towards the metabolic syndrome. And uh, what's fun is we've now uh, engineered uh, uh, mice uh, that express LB Nox or Mito LB Nox or TP Nox. Uh, these are flox deletes. And so we've just now begun to cross them with albumin Cree so that at least in the liver we have them. They're actually viable mice, believe it or not. And uh, this is very pre preliminary. And uh, Russ said it was okay for me to present it over here. But what you can see is that the LB Nox but not TP Nox helps to uh, uh, prevent this glucose, this homeostasis. So uh, further support that it's the NADH NAD and not NADPH NADP. So um, another um, concept I really want to try to share with this group is uh, what we're calling the circulating uh, uh, redox. Okay, and this is going to be work related to uh, Anupam uh, Pathigri. He just started his own lab at Emory, and so. When a disease cell has reductive stress, it can have it because of a mitochondrial disease, it can be acquired also in the context of things like the metabolic syndrome, uh, there's going to be a high NADH NAD ratio, and then that's going to be spilling this lactate. Okay. Now, as it turns out, when that happens, a neighboring cell okay, that didn't have a problem to begin with is now going to feel that. Okay, because these electrons, these two electrons are going to go out, they're going to get dumped on pyruvate to produce lactate. This is going to be circulating. And now this can actually lead to what's called non-cell autonomous uh, pathology. Even though the defect is in this cell, these electrons are going to go in the form of lactate enter into this cell, and the exact opposite is going to happen. Now those two electrons are going to increase the NAD to NAD ratio, and this can cause problems in this cell, even though it never had a problem to begin with. And so um, we think that this is actually going to be extremely important for systemic disease. Like if you're thinking about a tissue, 
If you have a problem, one, if you have one tissue that's hypoxic, okay, stuff is gonna build up, the neighbors are gonna feel it. If you have one tissue that has mito disease, neighboring tissues are gonna feel it because of this redox transmission. And so um, what Anupam did was he wondered whether we could directly target the circulating redox. So what he did was uh, he engineered an enzyme, it's a lactate oxidase that's been fused to a catalase, and then uh, he expressed and purified it, and now he injects this into a mouse. So this is not a genetically encoded thing. You have to, it's a protein that you have to inject into the mouse, or you can throw into cell culture. And so um, uh, what he could show is that if you, if you give a mouse metformin, metformin is a complex one inhibitor, uh, it's gonna send uh, the lactate levels up. If he throws a uh, lox cat and injects it into the bloodstream, uh, the animal's lactate to prurate ratio is gonna go down. And that's understandable because the enzyme uh, that he's engineered is gonna convert lactate to pyruvate uh, with water as a byproduct. But what's really neat is if you look at the brain NADH NAD ratio, right? Uh, we've given metformin, the NADH NAD ratio goes up. And so he's not sending anything into the brain. He's only targeting the circulating redox. We can actually bring down the NADH NAD ratio in the brain. And so it, 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 it's a totally new concept that we're excited about, about how non-cell autonomous pathology pathogenesis can take place. And so um, just a couple of uh, takeaways and considerations for 4DCP, some very specifics related to some of the science from our lab. Um, we've done a lot of work doing metabolomics just to see what appears to be changing, at least in the metabolome, the main principal component is a high NADH NAD ratio. We call this reductive stress. This is also seen in classical metabolic syndrome. The question is whether this is a driver of pathology, at least in the case of metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. Uh, we think that this is actually in the causal path. We're crossing these Albinox mice to mouse models of mitochondrial disease to see which of those different pathologies, the brain disease or the liver disease, which of those may be attributable in a causal way to this redox parameter. Um, and then some bigger concepts um, is just the idea that electrons from one cell, from one organelle can spill over to another or from one cell can spill over to another. And this can actually drive disease, but it can also just be important for physiology as well. Uh, and I think you know, these tools uh, that we've been developing, I think this is just the start. Uh, of, of a new era in metabolism where we can now begin to evaluate causality. It'd be great to render some of these tools under optical control or chemical control for more rapid kinetics. Uh, but I think these are first generation technologies at least. And, and I think Genelia is a place where these could really, really, really blossom. Uh, and my, my, my final like, hope is that uh, when people start thinking about 4D CP, they'll be scratching their heads wondering, is it 4D cell physiology or is it 4D cell pathophysiology? So uh, I hope we'll be able to embrace uh, disease as well uh, through this uh, initiative. And so with that, I uh, will thank you for your attention and take any questions you may have. This is a fantastic talk. Uh, so engineering metab metabolic pathways is known to be difficult. Uh, one possible reason is that there are lots of redundant alternative pathways that you can immediately compensate. Can you comment on the known like uh, difficulties there and what's your thoughts on addressing those difficulties in engineering metabolic pathways? Thanks. Yeah. No, it's, it's a great question. And I think to some extent, we sometimes don't even know what these redundancies are. And so I actually think that sometimes when you're actually able to create a bypass, for example, it's actually an opportunity to even discover what all of those redundancies uh, are. Uh, but it, it, you're right, there's an entire field of metabolic engineering that um, uh, exists out there. Uh, and I think some of those tools can actually be brought into this uh, 4D cell physiology paradigm as well. Oh yeah, I had a question about the ATP levels because you mentioned that when you looked at the at all these metabolites that you didn't see a difference. But if if the phosphorylation is not not working in the electron chain and you have an accumulation of lactate, I would expect that also to make glycolysis also happen slower, right? So why do you think ATP is not changing? Yeah, so uh, great question. So um, 
uh, remember, we have other pathways for making ATP as well, including glycolysis. And uh, these, uh, uh, these are not like perfect uh, individuals. I mean, they're very, very sick kids typically. Uh, under basal conditions, we just don't see an ATP deficiency signature when we stress them with exercise. Uh, they clearly do have ATP uh, production uh, defects. So, but I, in many, many instances, uh, substrate level phosphorylation actually does uh, compensate pretty well. I have a minor question about uh, Dr. Goodman's latest research uh, about that LB NOx but not TP NOx. Uh, I'm sorry, where's the person that's asking the question? Here, oh, sorry, I, okay, I'm yeah. wearing a mask. Uh, yeah, I no, know. sure, I was like, <laughs> is that is that from uh, one of the 900? Yeah, uh, I think LB NOx but not TP NOx will rescue the glucose tolerance when expressed in the liver. But uh, I have a very minor question on that slide. Why, why the two baseline in the control seems too drastically different? Uh, and while the, uh, the treatment yeah. itself seems to have a minor effect. Yeah, this is, uh, again, this is uh, very, very early, fresh data. You're talking about these two black areas under yes, the curve? it seems that yeah. those different variations yeah. seems to be even larger than the, uh, like, transgene. Yeah, yeah. so uh, these are uh, transgenic uh, mice, right? You have TP Nox mice, and then you have litter mate controls, and then you have LB Nox mice and litter mate controls. And so there are uh, big differences from, uh, uh, th there can be strain to strain differences in glucose homeostasis for sure. But this is, this is again, this is very, very early uh, data, but the effect of the um, LB NOx seems to be very pronounced relative to the effect of TP NOx. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi. Hey. Um, fabulous talk, lots of questions, but I wondered if you could comment on the question of cell type vulnerabilities in different tissues. In one way, if you think about what you presented, you've got some really fundamental biology and mechanisms that are, you mean, you've got tools where you can start to think about, um, you know, targeting both cytosolic and ADPH mechanisms, but also extracellular. At the same time, we know that there is cell type vulnerabilities. And so I wonder, you know, thinking about 40CP and the strengths of this group here at Genalia, like how are you thinking about getting at that question? Um, and, and, and I think beyond therapeutic implications, just the biology of identifying, you know, certain cells in different tissues may be more vulnerable than others. And I just wondered if you could give some perspective on that. Yeah. I actually think that uh, one of the finest problems in all of biomedicine is actually tissue specific pathology. Um, and I try to illustrate that even with two patients that have mutations, different parts of complex one, totally, totally different phenotypes, right? Um, and this extends even, the mitochondria has its own translational system. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've got a lot of tyranny synthetases. Mm -hmm. Mutations in ours too leads to a cardiomyopathy. Mutation in a different tyranny synthetase leads to ovarian dysgenesis a different one to white matter disease and a different one to gray matter disease. Yeah. And that's, those are all the tyranny synthetases just making 13 proteins. Yeah. And, and what you're saying is, is, is it's so generalizable, like why is Huntington's disease right. affecting basal ganglion substantia nigris impacted in Parkinson's disease? And because the genetic lesion is found in all, you know, in most of these instances is universal, right? right? And so this has been a little bit of a journey for me, honestly. Like one of our early contributions, like Jennifer said, was characterizing the mitochondrial proteome from 14 different organs. So I had hoped that there'd be a very neat mapping between those 150 disease genes. All those that were leading to a cardiomyopathy would be very highly expressed in the heart. And all those that were leading to diabetes would be highly expressed in the beta cell. There's like almost like zero correlation between where these things are expressed, right? And the site of tissue pathology. Okay. Then later it became, we've had an entire um, uh, part of our lab interested in oxygen, unused oxygen. Right. And I was thinking maybe that's the answer or now maybe it's LDH and reductive stress. And so it, it's complicated. I mean, I really do think that something like complex systems or it's a really interesting idea to think about complex systems and, and pathophysiology, but it, I, I don't know the answer. I hope 40CP solves it in the next 15 years because we have not been able to solve that problem for mito disease in the last 15 years in my lab. Yeah. Well, let me see. This is beautiful. Uh, I actually kind of follow-up question. So 
I think the NADPH and NAD, the red depth um, level. So do you think in different tissues, it actually may have a different target that's correlated with the pathology, yeah. um, heterogeneity? Because you talk about the lactate, but yeah. I just wondered other target in different. Yeah, w w without a doubt. I, I actually do think that some pathologies will be traceable back to NADH, NED, for example. Not in all tissues, but in some. And there may be an NADH, NED linked process like gluconeogenesis, right, and uh, hepatic insulin resistance, right? So it may be the case that uh, as we start crossing our mito disease models to the LBNOX technology, we may erase some of the pathology in one tissue but not in others. We may begin to understand how these are, are connecting up with each other. A more specific question about the last part, the LOX cat. So it's targeting circulating lactate, but lactate in some part, like nerve system, is quite important. So, so how, you, like from the treatment point of view, so how you yeah. see, you know, to optimize the condition, like to override some of the possible side effects. Yeah, I, I think right now we're using this mostly as a research tool to understand how. Uh, if you have mixed cultures, for example, and you have a problem in one cell type, how, do you, how does that spill over and cause a phenotype in another cell type? There's not an easy way to uh, uh, do it. So, so LOXCAT is something you can add to the cell culture, for example, and impact that cell-to-cell -cell communication. Um, it is interesting to think about whether it could be used as a therapeutic as well. And there's precedent, asparaginase and streptokinase, there's a lot of precedent for enzymes that are injectable that could be therapeutics. But I think right now it's more of a research tool for us. Okay, beautiful talk. Thanks for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on your vision for 40 cellular pathophysiology. Um, I find this particularly compelling because in many aspects of medicine, I would say uh, the fourth dimension has validated value. Um, there's an entire field onto itself, histopathology, where you look at features that are arranged in space that are related to cellular physiology and which are predictive of disease. But one of my pet peeves is that uh, for a lot of perhaps clinicians, they stop at just identifying the markers because it is valuable without delving into the mechanisms underlying that. Is that what you see for this direction of pathophysiology? To be explicit, let's say um, my pet peeve is uh, when EBV infects cells, we're trained to look for uh, these uh, owl's eyes inclusion bodies, which are very visible. But no one bothers to ask, what is the mechanism that rearranges the nucleus to shape that sort of feature. Let me know if that's too ambiguous. No, I'm trying to just understand. Um, I mean, the latter part of your, your question is, uh, say pathologists will make lots of observations, right? You'll see uh, certain types of ring setter blasts, for example, or you'll see other types of pathology upon EBV infection. But you're asking, uh, how do you get beyond observation to mechanism? Is that broadly what you're? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think at a high level, I, I think the, the core theme of my, my talk today was in the realm of metabolism, moving away from being purely observational to being more perturbative to try to understand in the time domain, for example, you know, what's uh, cause and effect. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I actually do think that uh, what, what physiology really is, is a synthesis of lots and lots of observations. And we're living in this incredible moment now where uh, I come, I, I, I'm formally trained in sort of genetics and genomics, and there's just so much genomic data right now. So those aren't visual uh, you know, images from the pathology lab. But, I mean, we're actually in the exponential phase of genomic data generation. Just, just to remind you what that means, if you take all of the data that we have as of October 12th, 2022 in genomics land, all of it, we're gonna double that in the next 12 years. 
I mean, that's how much data is being generated right now. Whole genome sequences, single cell, all this type of stuff. And that's got to all be synthesized. Um, and uh, I love the idea that 4D cell physiology is going to be the home where all of these molecular observations genome-wide are going to be put together. But we're, we're going to have to come up with ways like generating data, our, our ability to synthesize data, right, and, and emerge with knowledge or insights, right, and principles. That's, I actually don't know how that's going to scale with how rapidly data is being generated. And I think that's a very, very broad challenge. Uh, I like to joke that, uh, uh, you know, even though the, co the cost of sequencing has dropped about a million fold over like a 12 year period, you know, the price of the bioinformatician has not dropped a million fold over a 12 year period. I mean, so these things are not scaling. And so we need to think about how to discover principles and synthesize um, uh, faster, but also in a very thoughtful, deeply mechanistic way. Yes, uh, consid considering the heterogeneity of the liver in terms of liver sonation, yeah. how you envision this NADH and AD ratios are operating and how these LVNOX and the different tools are actually doing their job. Yeah, yeah it, it's a really classic question. I mean, what, one of the technologies that we are very interested in is what's called spatial metabolomics. And so instead of making an image based on uh, the light spectrum, right, you can actually make an image on the basis of a mass spectrum. And uh, some of the folks in our world of metabolism are just now beginning to play with uh, it's still, it's been around for a while, but I think that technology is just about to hit an inflection point, like the mass uh, sensitivity, the mass resolution, uh, the speed. Uh, it's just now at an inflection point where I think it can be great to look at things like liver zonation uh, and, and look at some of these metabolites. And in terms of the rescue, do you attribute that to a specific zone, a specific subset of hepatocytes, mm -hmm. or do you think it's actually a... a affecting all of the hepatocytes evenly? Well, we do think that it's a hepatocyte. Uh, it, it, we think it's related to hepatocytes, but with respect to zonation, as you know, there's huge gradients of oxygen. These NAD to NAD ratios change as well. Uh, so I, I, I actually think that's a fine, fine problem also for, uh, for DCP. Chini? Yeah, um, we have a question from Ronald Holtz online. What is the mechanism for reductive stress from circulating lactate in bystander cells and tissues? Yeah, so maybe that wasn't completely clear, but what will happen is if, if this is a, quote, healthy cell and it's got a mito defect, as an example, you can get a high NADH NAD ratio for other reasons. These electrons go here. These electrons go from, will land on pyruvate to do a two electron reduction to lactate. This goes out. This can now circulate. The LDH reaction is completely reversible. So now there's some other cell or tissue elsewhere. It was just minding its business, but now it's gonna see a deluge of lactate that comes in. The LDH reaction is now going to elevate the NADH-NAD ratio. So now this cell type is facing a higher NADH-NAD ratio. Chemical reactions that are NAD plus dependent in that cell type are now gonna feel a choke point. Okay. Um, I want to thank you all for those great questions, and I also want to thank our speakers, especially. Um, and uh, let's uh, now adjoin and go to Bob's, because there's lots of fun things to talk about um, based on what we've heard today. So uh, thank, I want to thank all the speakers again, and thank you for uh, really a great start to the symposium. Thanks. And most importantly, don't forget to come back tomorrow morning. Yeah. Um, we get started at 9.15 tomorrow morning, so we'll see you then. Actually, can we...